uh, and my two brothers. Uh, my dad, all through my childhood, was a very frustrated man. He's frustrated over uh, his marriage, his personal life, uh, and his family. Uh, he didn't spend a lot of time with us. I had an older brother, 14 years older than myself, so he was an only child uh, for 10 years. By the time I started coming of age, uh, he was already out of the house. By the time I was five or six years old, he was already 19, 20, uh, and in the military. Uh, and then I had another brother that was four years older than myself, and my dad uh, had a job that caused him to travel a lot. So uh, he'd be gone for two or three weeks at a time, home for a week or two, uh, and then back out on the road again. Uh, and so I never really got to know my dad until, I'm in my late 40s, until much later, uh, uh, much later in life as a teenager, in my uh, era growing up, I grew up as a teenager in the late 60s and 70s, graduated uh, from high school in 1972, and the day after my high school graduation, my friend and I left home, we hitchhiked uh, up into Northern California, and I never looked back, I never uh, went back and lived ho at home, uh, again, I resented my parents for a variety of reasons, uh, my own, their sin, uh, my own uh, sin and dysfunction uh, in my own life. And fortunately, very fortunately, my wife and I got saved at a very young age. We were uh, 19 and then 20 years old shortly after uh, my conversion. Um, and then shortly after that, my wife and I started witnessing to our whole family. Both of her parents got saved. They're both still alive today, uh, saved. And, and then uh, my mother got saved about, uh, I think, within four to six months after my wife and I got saved. And then my dad got saved a couple of years uh, uh, after that. But they lived in uh, California at that time when, when I got saved and was being raised in the Tucson church. They lived in California where I grew up and my wife and I lived in Tucson uh, and then fairly rapidly uh, with my wife and I were only saved uh, just under four years when we got sent out for the first time so our ministry took us uh, 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 you know to a variety of different places over the next uh, uh, 15 or 16 uh, years or so and so during that time we didn't talk much with my parents, didn't spend a lot of time, all the times we did spend were very, very good, but as far as really getting to know my dad and being able to benefit from his influence, that didn't happen uh, until 2002, so I've been here by that time uh, eight years pastoring the church here. Uh, my father and mother, because of their age and my mother's Alzheimer's disease, uh, I talked them into buying a home and moving here. Uh, and that's when I really began to appreciate my dad uh, in a new way, and I began to recognize uh, a heritage that he uh, was passing on to me. Uh, that heritage was born of the type of man that he was, how he was raised, apart from all the sinful mess of his life, uh, there were some very valuable attributes uh, that really came to light after his conversion, and I'll share uh, those with you uh, in a few moments. So when my dad moved here, for the very first time in my life, when he moved here, I was 48 years old, for the very first time in my life, I got to hang out with him. I never had done that before, not as a child, uh, my teenage rebellion years, of course, and then the early years of my conversion in ministry, there were visits here and there, uh, but never hanging out, never really having any meaningful uh, conversations with my dad until I'm 48 years old. And hanging out, talking, listening, and since my dad by that time was elderly, he was, I was born when he was almost 40, so there's kind of a missing generation there. Uh, I'm the youngest of my, three, uh, my two brothers, uh, my oldest brother, the next brother, and then myself. Uh, and so, when I'm 48, he is, uh, uh, you know, in his 80s already. So I don't have much time. Uh, and since...
since he knew he was drifting toward his earthly departure, he did a lot of talking, uh, gave me a lot of advice, I did a lot of listening, he did a lot of reminiscing. Uh, you can talk to uh, 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 Bobby and Carrie and Joe and Julie and uh, Jerry and Jenny, they also got to spend quite a bit of time with him and uh, he really took uh, uh, opportunity to try to teach us some things and explain some things when he would see Bobby or Jerry or Carrie or Joe uh, do things that he didn't like or he thought were wrong, he would say so. Uh, he used to love hanging out with me, coming to the office, he would come to the office, he'd call me up, Paul, are you going to pick me up this morning? And he would want me just to get him, take him to my office, he would sit there while I was working, people in and out of my office, I'm doing budgeting and paying bills and paperwork and staff in and out of the office, and he loved just sitting there, he would read a newspaper, uh, we would converse uh, uh, in the middle of uh, my busyness, and uh, those are some of the very best memories uh, I have uh, of my dad. My dad had a great appreciation, uh, and he told me often he had a great appreciation for what God was doing in my life, in Renee's life, in my children, in his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, uh, and he was actually in awe of it all when he saw me functioning in this setting here in this church, uh, uh, he would tell me, and it meant a lot to me, it may not sound like much to you sitting here, but he would tell me he was proud of me. I mean, here I am, almost 50 years old and beyond 50 actually, uh, by the time he was here for a few years. Uh, that's the first time I ever heard uh, those words from my dad. He would tell us uh, how much he loved us. Never heard that before uh, in my life. Here's a few things that really stand out to me that I want to share with you. One of them is, of course, my father got saved fairly late in life. He was 60 years old. Uh, uh, maybe uh, if he got saved, in, I, think, I believe he got saved in 1978. So he would have been 62 years old, is about, which is about the age that I am now. If I had lived in sin up until this point in my life, I don't think there'd be much hope I'd ever get saved. I probably wouldn't be alive. And as I said, my father was a lifelong alcoholic. He had a lot of frustrations in his life. He was somewhat religious. We went to Catholic Mass every Sunday morning throughout uh, my childhood. But I think the most powerful aspect of his life would be the fact that he was not headed in the direction that his life ended up. For most of his life, he was on his way to hell. He was able to recognize at the age of 62 that he was going in the wrong direction, that he had done bad things, that he had failures, and that he fell short. And by God's grace, he was able to make a, a correction in the course of his life at 62 years old. Some of you sitting here, you're saying you're a serious man, but there are issues in your life. You need to make some corrections in the course of your life. And my dad taught me about that, that at this, you know, I won't say elderly age, because I'm a little older than that, but not much. Um, he was able to correct the course of his life. He was able to humble himself and, and receive Jesus Christ and, as his Lord and Savior, and I thought of the conversion of the Apostle Paul, because I think there are some similarities there. In Acts 9-1, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against his disciples of the Lord, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked letters uh, uh, from him f uh, to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then Jesus said, I'm Jesus, uh, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So, while my dad wasn't to that extreme, he certainly did oppose my wife and I when we first gave our lives to Christ, especially uh, when I told my dad we were going to tithe and give 10% of our money to the church. He exploded. He thought we were part of a cult. Uh, they're going to get all your money is what he told me over the phone. Uh, and so my dad was bound. My dad was lost. My dad was hardened in his uh, sin for 61 years. Uh, uh, of his life. And then 
uh, after this particular incident with Saul of Tarsus, we're still in the same chapter of the book of Acts. And, and the Bible says that immediately Saul preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on uh, this name in Jerusalem? Uh, and has come here for that purpose so he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, uh, proving that Jesus uh, is uh, the Christ. My mother got saved in my living room. Like I said, about four to six months after my wife and I had been converted, my dad wasn't interested. He just wasn't. My mother went home from that trip went back to the Catholic Church once and didn't groove on it anymore. Although she'd been a lifelong Catholic, she began to look around. I don't even know how she found the Assembly of God Church that she began to attend. But I met the pastor one time, a good man, preached the gospel. I went to a service on a Sunday evening once and he preached, he gave altar calls. And so my mother became a member of that church. And so she attended for a couple of years Meanwhile, my brother and I, my brother was saved at that time, uh, were getting very frustrated with my dad because he just wouldn't budge. Just wouldn't. We couldn't convince him. Our testimonies, uh, what God was doing in our lives, uh, he just wouldn't budge. And then, without any provocation from my mother or myself, one Sunday morning, my father woke up in the morning and what the normal... Uh, habit had become since my mom started attending the Assembly of God churches that she would get up for church Sunday morning while my father uh, would stay in bed and have a little bit of a late to sleep in. But this particular Sunday morning my dad was awake and getting dressed before my mother and uh, she said uh, to him, what are you doing? Where are you going? And he said, I'm going to go to church with you today. Again, none of us Provoked that. My mother was praying, we're praying. He got up, he went to church that morning, responded to the altar call, gave his life to Christ, and was powerfully born again. Converted and changed as dramatically as the Apostle Paul. He and my mother went back to church that night, and there was a presentation by the Gideons International. Uh, as many of you may know, that is a... Uh, uh, organization uh, that is devoted and committed to distributing Bibles. They put them in hotel rooms. They distribute them all over the world, hundreds of thousands and millions of Bibles. Uh, plus, they have courses and classes uh, that teach people how to witness, how to share the gospel. And so that night, the day of his conversion, uh, he joined Gideon's International uh, and became a profound witness for Jesus Christ. He started telling his colleagues at work uh, that he'd gotten saved. They couldn't believe it. He's uh, uh, flying on an airplane. At that time, he's still traveling extensively all over the country and the world. And he would always witness. He carried around. We, we had them all over our house, these little green uh, Gideon's Bibles that he would carry around in his briefcase uh, and distribute them. He would go to high schools uh, and witness and pass out Bibles uh, uh, to high school uh, students. And so this to me, as I read those two uh, portions of the Apostle Paul's conversion, uh, I thought of my dad and the drama of his conversion because my dad had to overcome a lot. He had to overcome uh, his alcoholic addiction. My father, as I said, was a hard liquor alcoholic. Uh, his drink of choice uh, was vodka straight from the bottle. Um, he never lost a job over it, was able to maintain, uh, he worked for the same company for 33 years, became a, a, a fairly influential uh, uh, executive in that business. Uh, my father had to overcome and his conversion had to break the scourge of addiction, his own bitterness and failures and disappointments uh, uh, and frustrations. Uh, and then as many of you know, after his conversion, uh, quite a number of years in 1990 and 1996, uh, my two older brothers committed suicide and took their lives. And so my dad, as a Christian, uh, has to process all of this. Any one of the things that I just mentioned uh, 
uh, could have derailed and permanently destroyed someone's life. I know a lot of people that backslide over a lot less than those things. But my dad never wavered one single time, never teetered on backsliding, never got mad at God, never questioned God. And the inspiration for that is that regardless of where you're at in your life, no matter what testimony you've built up up until this time, no matter how people know you, there's always a chance to completely turn things around and build a new reputation and build a new testimony. I thought of the thief on the cross. Uh, there was beside Jesus two thieves. One was reviling him. Well, they both started reviling him, but one had a change of heart on the cross. And... Um, both of these thieves lived lives that justified the death sentence. And this one penitent thief said so. He said, uh, we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. Uh, but this man, meaning Jesus, has done nothing wrong. So after an entire life lived uh, that led him to a deserved death sentence, uh, he's hanging on the cross, uh, yet we remember him not for all that he'd done, but we remember him for the event that took place uh, while Jesus was being crucified uh, when he said, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. We remember him as the first post-death uh, uh, of Jesus uh, uh, person that was ushered uh, uh, into heaven. There's always hope to change things. There's always hope to become a new man in Christ, and there's always hope to change the priorities of your life. So a few things I want to leave you with, and I will open it up for any questions that you have uh, on the general topic here of uh, uh, influence and who has influenced your life. I think of three things that my father left me that I think uh, have contributed to any blessing on my life. Uh, obviously, it's due to conversion and Jesus and what God has done. But my father imparted some things, and it struck me. Uh, the final verse of our text, and there Abraham was buried, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed Isaac, his son. And God blessed Isaac, his son, because of what Abraham passed on to him. Right? We can make that statement. So I think the same is true with my dad. So three things that I thought of that my dad passed on, and I don't have a lot of time to uh, expound on these things, I'll make a few comments about them. The first uh, is a work ethic. My father grew up, as I said, he was born in 1916. They lived a hard scrabble life on a ranch uh, in northern New Mexico, uh, just south of Albuquerque. Uh, he was born uh, in Belen. <coughs> Uh, my grandfather at that time owned several hundred acres, uh, uh, and then the most formative years of my dad's life were the Great Depression that began in October of uh, 1929 when the stock market crashed, uh, unemployment rates in America were over 50%, uh, people had no money, they were broke, uh, but my father had, my grandfather rather, had this property, this land, and so they were able to uh, maintain a livelihood, but they had to work very hard. My father was the quintessential person uh, who had to get up at three or four in the morning uh, and do chores and milk cows and feed animals uh, uh, and prepare things for uh, other people that would be working that day. My father had his first horse when he was seven years old, his first gun when he was nine. Uh, he would ride that horse to school, uh, ride on the way home, shoot rabbits sometimes. He'd take his gun to school. They could do that back then. <laughs> Seven years old, nine years old rather, shoot rabbits on the way home. Many times my grandmother would cook them uh, for dinner. Uh, but my dad had a work ethic, and the work ethic is uh, that in this life uh, you get, uh, you don't get anything without paying a price. And some of you younger men, you need to learn this. You think uh, that everything should be handed. You should have a brand new vehicle, a brand new house, uh, go down to the furniture store and get all this brand new furniture, uh, and that's what you're entitled to. Uh, uh, you're entitled to zilch unless you work for it. This is why I am philosophically opposed uh, to parents buying automobiles for their children without them paying for it. 
I'm opposed to that. You can get upset with me uh, if you want. You may think it's a good idea. You may never, never have had problems uh, uh, as a result of that. Uh, but I can point to most kids who have had vehicles bought for them. They had to do nothing in order to get it. Uh, doesn't work out so great always, does it? So this is a work ethic. My father would not buy me anything. He would make me pay for it. I had to work for it. This is just who he was and how he functioned. Uh, my father became relatively wealthy uh, in his life through his salary from work uh, and purchase from, uh, purchases from property. Uh, but he would only buy a new vehicle about every 10 years. He took care of his cars. I have a little booklet in my uh, office desk right now. Every time he filled up with gas, uh, he would put how many gallons, uh, how many miles the car had on it. Every time he changed the oil, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he took care of it. It was like driving a, a brand new car, but it had 100,000 miles on it. It was so clean, well taken care of, ran good. He took care of everything. He valued the possessions uh, that he had, took nothing for granted. Uh, because everything in his life as he was growing up, uh, you had to work for it. There were no handouts. There was no freebies. There was no uh, father who could buy you everything you dreamed of having in life. So he left me with a work ethic. That's where my work ethic comes from. And it's been lifelong with me. Pastor, between my dad and, and Pastor Mitchell and Pastor Warner, I have no option but to work my tail off. The second thing he left me was integrity. <coughs> he had integrity and honesty. Again, there was the sin, alcoholism, but his integrity survived all that. I remember uh, we were having breakfast one morning. Uh, with some of the disciples and my dad was there and the subject of bounce checks came up. I don't know how it came up. Uh, I won't even ask how many of you here have ever bounced a check. And so someone turned to my dad and asked him. And he said, so my dad at that time was pushing 90 years old. There were two occasions in his life, he said, where a check was bounced and neither one of them were his fault. It was the bank's fault. Uh, my dad had integrity when it came to handling money. I remember one time toward the end of his life, I went into his uh, house and he was on the phone and he was very frustrated. And uh, he got off the phone, he put the phone down, he's frustrated. I said, Dad, what's wrong? He said, the credit card company uh, put an $8 finance charge on my bill this month and I'm trying to straighten it out. My father, during his whole life, never paid a penny of interest on a credit card. How much interest have you paid on credit cards? You wouldn't even have a clue, would you? You don't even know that you're paying interest now, probably. <laughs> and it's at 22%. <laughs> so my dad never paid. He told me that he pounded his finger on the desk. And then I said, Dad, how much time have you spent on the phone today? Well, about an hour or two. I said, Dad, just write a check for $8 more, pay it, and move on with your life. That's what I would have done. He said, son. It's the principle. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't write out the check. And my dad had hundreds of thousands. He could have written the check out, no problem. But his integrity forced him to a certain type of behavior. And the third thing that uh, he left me with is relationships. My dad had the natural gift and ability to connect with people. Everywhere he went, he made friends. There are still people at the bank. There's a woman named Mary that works for Wells Fargo at the branch that I go into with online banking. You don't have to go into the bank very often anymore. But whenever I go in there, I always pop in and say hi to Mary. She became my dad's servant. She loved my dad. Every time he came in there, she wanted to be the one that waited on him, served him, helped him. He was kind, generous, complimentary. He knew all about her family, her life, her relationships. And I can take that little signet, that little story, and multiply it a hundred times. Everywhere my dad went, he had friends, he liked people, he had an ability uh, to connect with people. Uh, when we had his homegoing service, after we went to the uh, uh, gravesite and had the gravesite service that Pastor Warner actually officiated at, we came back to the church for uh, fellowship and food, and a woman walked in uh, when we were at that stage, and uh, she looked me up, 
and uh, she said, I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to come to uh, the main part of the funeral today, but I just wanted to come and show my respect for your dad. And so I asked her who she was. She was a waitress at, at La Malinche. And so what I would do is I would take my dad uh, to breakfast at La Malinche, and sometimes I would either eat with him and come to prayer here or drop him off uh, uh, and then come to prayer. And he would just sit there by himself. He'd read a newspaper. He'd engage somebody in conversation. And this waitress took a liking to him, and they got to know each other. I had no idea about this until she walked in uh, to the funeral service. And then two of my dad's neighbors, uh, my dad had a way. I mean, I live in a neighborhood. I hardly know my neighbors. I try, but people stay so, so reserved today. But my dad inserted himself and had several neighbors that had become uh, his friends when he moved on to Spire Terrace uh, uh, over here on the east side. And uh, uh, four of them came uh, to my dad's funeral to show uh, their respect. So here's some, I'm going to finish now. Here's what I want you to take away from this little, uh, this little talk today. Number one, take advantage of the relationships that you have access to and around you that you can benefit from. There's people all around you right now that can help you, influence you, advise you, show you the way. You need it. Nobody's an island. You're not self-made. You're not smarter than everybody else. At the age of 48, when my dad moved here, I learned more in those few years that I had with him uh, than so many other years. Just the practical advice, watching my dad, listening to him, how he functioned, how he conducted his life, how he operated in relationships and with money, uh, and his uh, work ethic that was still alive and well, even into his uh, 80s. So you need to take advantage of people that are around you that can help you. I think so many people spend so much time resentful about individuals. The very people sometimes that you resent are the ones who can help you the most. Number two, be someone that can be a primary influence in another life. I wonder how many of you could take somebody under your wing, and I wonder how many of you could identify, uh, I wonder how many of you could be identified sometime in the future as someone that really, that, that somebody would mention, you know, uh, Luis or uh, Ted or Gabriel or Craig, and that guy really helped me and took me under their wings. I thought of Fred Lozano when I was uh, putting this little discussion together. Fred Lozano was that. You think about Freddy. Freddy, for those of you that knew him, was the most common of men I've ever known. He had a lot of foibles, a lot of personal issues, a lot of, you know, chaos and dysfunction in his life, but uh, he was asked to be the best man in our church at 19 different weddings. We counted him up one day. That's what people thought of Freddie. Many times when I would talk to people, yeah, Freddie followed up on me. Freddie used to pick me up for church. Freddie took me out for coffee afterward and encouraged me. And there are men sitting here that if I asked uh, who's influenced you in life, you'd say Fred Lozano was one of the people that influenced you in life. And the reason I use this example is because he didn't have any extraordinary uh, skill, wealth, uh, uh, education. Uh, he just cared about people and was willing to take time for people and help people and, and minister to them. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. People need an example. I needed my dad at that stage in my life. He helped me more than you can uh, appreciate uh, and realize. People need an example. They need to see the real thing in action. It's one thing for someone to tell me that I need a work ethic. Uh, it's another thing to see it in my dad. It's some, uh, one thing for someone to lecture me about how I need to have financial integrity. It's another thing to see how my dad functioned and operated <clears throat> throughout his life. It, one thing to say you need to love people, but quite another thing to see my dad naturally gravitate toward other people and take an interest uh, in them. People need to see the real thing we were created by God to be influenced and to follow. And I'm thankful today on this anniversary of his passing 
and today would have been his 102nd birthday. Uh, I'm very grateful for my dad. And again, that scripture, God blessed uh, after the death of Abraham, his son Isaac. And I think there's a dimension of God's blessing on my life for a variety of reasons. Obviously, conversion, Pastor Warner, Pastor Mitchell, a lot of other things, but my dad had a major hand in that. Amen. Why don't we bow our heads for a moment? And um, uh, I think that's the challenge for you to take those two points home with you today. Take advantage of relationships that you have access to and be someone that can be a primary influence in another life. My dad did that without trying to. It just is who he was. We were created to be influenced, get close to people that can influence your life. Father, we thank you for the grace of God that's here. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to share these thoughts concerning my father, his conversion, his life. God, let there be something here that can minister to every one of these men that have gathered together. Let grace be realized right now, shaping our hearts after righteousness. Let us take seriously the opportunities we have for God. Lord, we give you praise and we glorify you and we thank you for all that you're doing in our hearts. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. I don't know if there would be any questions or uh, perhaps a comment or two, but let's open it up for just a second. I took quite a bit of time uh, with that. But uh, if you have any question or a comment or something you want to add, Brother George. Pastor, uh, what would be the best advice that you would give to someone? Because it, obviously there is issues with you know, fathers that have uh, abandoned or made huge mistakes and, you know, you, you, we become Christians and we give our lives and we're called to forgive and we're called to, uh, you know, for redemption and restoration to take place. But what would you give uh, an advice to someone, a young man who had a, a really serious, uh, you know, uh, issue. issue in their life to... to, to, to well, there's two things, two ways I would answer that. Forgiveness can only be consummated when the person who's offended you repents, right? So if the father of that individual repented like my dad did after all the damage that he'd done to my brothers and I, he repented. And, and so that forgiveness can be realized and actualized and consummated. If there isn't repentance by the one who is offended, you have to just let it go. And God will give you grace to be able to come out from underneath the damage that's been done and be healed. And in the confines of the church, especially one like ours, uh, you can find a father replacement. A brother, maybe a little older than you, a pastor, will take time with you. Uh, you'll have to compensate for that. All of us have to overcome the damage that's been done in our lives because of sin. And it comes in different ways and different forms. So if my mom and dad had not gotten saved uh, and therefore had not repented for the damage that they had done to me, uh, I would have to forgive and let it go, although my forgiveness wouldn't be reciprocated by them. That's what, that's what goes a long way to healing the damage, right? So the damage can still be healed. Uh, it's a little more challenging and difficult, I think, and it has to be discovered in your prayer life. You have to let things go in your life and not be angry over what's happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Yes? Did your father ever try to argue with you after your salvation? Yeah, I said initially very early on when I told him I was tithing, he blew a cork. <laughs> got very mad uh, about that. He would come to church when him and my mom would visit us when we were in Tucson. <coughs> Him and my mom from California would come to visit us on occasion when my mom was a Christian already. In fact, she got baptized in the Tucson church. I had a picture. We used to go to a uh, motel swimming pool in those days to baptize. When my mother got baptized, my father was watching. He would come to church. But I'd say apart from the tithing thing, he wouldn't argue with us uh, other than he would resist getting saved. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't persecution or anything like that. But, but the tithing thing really but then, as I've shared with you before, he became a big giver and tiger after his conversion. Yeah. George. You know, Pastor, I had the privilege of, I mean, I remember right now when you were talking, 
I don't know how it came to be, but your dad went a couple of times with me to work. Yeah, I remember that. And hung around with me all day long. He just wanted to, I mean, I would go out to estimates and he'd be, I mean, we'd be talking and I'd park in front of this house, get off to talk to the customer and I'd leave the air conditioner on for your dad to be in there. And I'd come out and we picked up what we were talking and we'd be doing that all over the place. And a uh, very interesting man, very, uh, you know, had a lot of insight when it came to how things worked, business, people. Yeah. And I, I did pick up some things from him as well. Do you remember any one single thing? Well, he, his work ethic, yeah. you know, he, he, he talked to me a lot about, he, he worked at a refinery. Yeah. And I worked at a refinery as an electrician, That's so right. yeah, he'd be interested. In we that. talked about all that kind of stuff, and yeah. it, it was interesting. But I mean, he was a, a a unique individual in the way he would. I mean, here is ninety-something years old, hanging around with me all day long. Yeah. What old man will do something like that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs>